Chapter 7 Sightseeing The muscles in Michael's thighs burned, creating fierce competition for his aching calves as his breaths became strained and heavy, sweat dripping from his naked torso. This was hard, harder than it should have been, but he reckoned he could be forgiven for that. It wasn't often a man climbed a skyscraper the day after being shot in the chest. The stairwell might be challenging, but there was no way Michael was letting a set of steps get the better of him. He reached another landing, glanced at the faded number 45, peeling from the wall as he passed. Surely, he was getting close. Then again, what could he expect from choosing the tallest building he saw from street level? He tugged at his backpack and wrestled with the rifle strapped over his shoulder as he tried to jog the pair into a more comfortable position. Failed. His mind quickly switched back to the next discomfort. The trousers clinging tight to his legs. Their last owner might have been the right height, but he'd been far skinnier than Michael. To make matters worse, the man's shirt and coat had been burnt and torn apart by the blaster shots, leaving a set of rags in worse condition than Finn's old jacket. Michael had tossed it. His brother might be dead, but it made no sense carrying around a ruined jacket to remember him by. The knife and bracelet made up for that. It wasn't all bad. Thankfully, one of the men had abandoned the khaki-coloured coat currently wrapped around his waist, which fit him surprisingly well. Michael had also awoken to a set of abandoned cooked sausages. Burnt, cold meat never tasted so good. Only after eating every scrap did he remember what the sausages were made from. It was sickening, thinking about the contents of his stomach, and he felt guilt-ridden when remembering how much he'd enjoyed them. Not even three days since leaving the freezer, and he'd already resorted to such disgusting measures. The sausages had helped him survive, and for that, he'd ensure whoever's flesh went into making them wouldn't go unavenged. Patches of sky were appearing in the sides of the stairwell now, letting shafts of daylight and glimpses of ruined city leak in. Michael expected this. From the last remnants of what used to be a road outside, he had seen the building's partially destroyed top, leaving an eroded crown to frame the sun above. The sun bothered him. He'd been woken by the morning light seeping into the reception lobby, tickling his face where he'd collapsed onto the floor, disturbingly close to the cooked corpse of the man who had been shot by his friends. Maybe friends wasn't the right term. The encounter left him with a lot of questions. He had been meaning to take the tall bandit hostage and interrogate the other two, but during the struggle, the knife he'd been holding to the man's throat ended up sticking through it. Either by accident or on purpose, Michael still wasn't sure, but that wasn't what worried him. Why had the two other men shot Michael and their comrade and fled afterwards, leaving behind free blaster rifles and bags of supplies? Why not capture him or finish the job once he'd passed out? Most remarkable of all was how he'd survived those blaster shots. He'd felt the first one shudder and rip apart the tall man, right before the second exploded inside his own chest. And here he was, back to normal. He hadn't expected his healing power to be strong enough to reconstruct entire body parts. Just how far could he push this new ability? Now yet another set of questions needed answering. He figured it was time to solve a few, and the quickest way to do that was to get up high. Michael rounded the corner to be greeted by a gaping door frame, the roof torn away by... Well... That was another mystery. He climbed the last few steps, slightly queasy, raising an arm to cover his head as he passed under the crumbling archway. Seemed the collapsing ruin in the jungle left an impression on him, one to be added to the list of battlefield souvenirs. The stairs must have continued at one time. Not any more. Michael surveyed the leftovers of a disintegrating platform, thinly shielded from the elements by a few columns of surviving wall and wretched piles of rubble. Metal beams stuck out from the debris, the skyscraper's skeleton, only covered in part by concrete, like that of a burning man's flesh sliding from his body, exposing the bone. Michael blinked a couple times, trying to forget the image. Didn't like how easily his mind wandered to memories like that one. He took a deep breath, 
stepped onto the platform and focused ahead. A panorama stretched out before him in all directions. Had to take a moment to process the image, realising that he had indeed been transported very far. Much further than he'd been guessing. There were no thick forests creeping into the city. There wasn't even a floor. In the distance was only ocean, surrounding him and the city he was perched right in the centre of. To his front and left, buildings claimed the land before abruptly stopping at the shoreline, where the calm flatness glinted at him between the gaps of a dishevelled city skyline in a big, toothy grin. He thought he smelt seawater, now it was there, but he knew he was too high up for that. The bandits from yesterday could be anywhere in this mess. How long would it take him to find their base? Michael turned. Found it. He took the eyeglass out of his trouser pocket that he'd found on the dead man and extended the tube. Decorated with a pleasant brass casing, it was a handy tool. Looking through the glass's eyepiece, he studied the base at the far end of the island. More accurate to call it a fortress. A patch of the city had been completely cleared to make a field of flattened rubble beyond which squatted a thick red wall topped by towers and battlements, designed by an architect very fond of triangles. The fortifications were tall, making it hard to see what hid behind them. The only visible occupants were another set of red walls on the left, layers getting smaller nearer the top, and a set of closely grouped skyscrapers on the right. Michael didn't need to be an expert on castles to know the second set of walls was the keep, the main base of operations. The huddled skyscrapers behind the walls were the only ones spared from being scrubbed off a site. Something on top connected the buildings, although it was hard to tell what from this angle. Movement. A twinkle of sunlight reflected off moving glass. Michael strained his eye through the tube, and his heart fluttered when he saw the ship gliding above the walls, coming to land. His hopes sank, along with the descending gunship, which was clearly not from the Alliance. An elongated passenger transport, with windows running along the sides that allowed the occupants to look outside. Another ship appeared, taking its predecessor's place as it flew out towards the sea. It was larger than the previous vessel, with two large shipping containers strapped onto its back. Civilian ships, or ones repurposed by bandits. Michael lowered the eyeglass and wiped his forehead. Despite the nipping wind, his skin was still hot and sweaty. Maybe his theory of being immune to illness had been off. He unstrapped his rifle and backpack and untied the coat from his waist to shield himself. He rooted through the backpack, took a drink of water and put the flask back next to the two cardboard boxes filled with blaster cells. The cells were matte grey coloured, each cylindrical tube the size of his thumb or an old-fashioned shotgun shell. There were thirty in each box although unfortunately their bottom quarters were wrapped in black lining, the marker of black blaster shots. Black market produced, fittingly enough, they provided a less powerful payload and shorter range to their blue counterparts. The cells came from the abandoned bags in the lobby, so at least his enemies would be using the same ammunition. That brought Michael closer to a level playing field. He was good in those. He looked from the bag and smiled at what lay in front. A rare feeling in recent days. Perched on a cairn of flat stones was a round metal compass encased with a glass cover. An antique, also made from brass like the eyeglass. He'd thought physical compasses like this one had long been relegated to museums. Out here, it seemed the old techniques were the best. Michael bent and clutched the compass. Found it stuck fast, glued to the top of the stones. He cast his eyes about grabbed a loose rock and bashed up the side of the compass, denting the casing before it sprang off the smooth surface, like removing a limpet. Every other item had been looted from the city, what was the harm of one more? Michael held the compass flat, using the needle and its lettered subjects to map the island in his head. The fort dominated the western side, and skyscrapers occupied the south and east. A clump of high-rises stranded in the sea. There were more to the north, a white stadium sitting amongst the thrashed buildings, and behind all that, a great rise of dark rock. For some reason, the sight seemed familiar. 
The mountain ran the length of the north side of the island, tallest in the center, sloping down again on either side with widespread arms to shelter the city. The cropping of rock wasn't just dark, it was pitch black, a volcanic material. Michael only knew that because prosperity was fenced by a similar type of mountain. Exactly the same type. Everything fell into place. Michael slowly reeled his eyes back, soaking in the view with a fresh sight. How could he recognize any city that had been so tarnished? Once he realized where he was, it became obvious. He stared down, over the precipice, and recognized the square sitting below. The same he'd gazed out at during his night with Scarlet. He looked for the building across the square. Gone. All that remained of the Alliance headquarters was a waveless beach of mortar and rubble. Michael dropped the compass and it rolled away without complaint. He sank to his knees, eyes cast to the ground. Took a deep breath through his nose, let it sigh out through his mouth, closed his eyes. The Alliance who governed the world and brought the rarely appreciated gift of peace for those who deserved it. The strongest pillar of civilization there was. They couldn't be. There were times in Michael's life when everything seemed hopeless. No matter what he tried, things just got worse. Slipping, slipping, the only direction downwards, until he'd snapped his eyes open and realized a horrible truth. He was at the bottom of a deep, dark pit. He might have been lucky enough to have friends and family on the surface, those who shone a light from the top to reach down, but that's all it would ever do. Give him a weak warmth. It's these moments where life's true tests lie. He could bathe in the light and become forlorn and motionless, eyes turned to the dark. Or he could turn towards the light, push forward and reach for solutions. His brother might be taken from him, the Alliance destroyed, but Michael didn't need a light to guide the way. He'd been here before, and knew, no matter how bad things seemed, there was always, always a way out. And this time, it was all on his shoulders. Michael opened his eyes, picked up his things, and stood. Needed to concentrate on the immediate future. Had to keep moving, before he drowned in his speculations, and he'd seen something in the square that he wanted to investigate. It would have shocked him on a normal day, intimidated him even, but, well, it's all relative. Michael exited the skyscraper through the dishevelled hotel lobby he'd stayed at weeks before, venturing into Central Square. It formed the focal point of four massive roads that followed the compass's points to the ends of the city. Two of the roads led to the ocean's sudden drop-off, and he would have been able to see the red walls of the fort down the western road if not for the heap of collapsed skyscraper blocking the way. A huge, colonnaded building, the old city hall, sat long and fat along one side of the square, its roof crushed in by whatever fighting had happened. Michael tried not to dwell on the building next to it. Perhaps the Alliance had survived and moved location, although hope can be a dangerous monster when exposed for the trickster it is. Michael focused instead on the square's main occupant he'd seen from above. A massive clump of metal, covered in so much vegetation it gave off the appearance of a hillock having sprung up amongst all the man-made construction. A black material poked through the gaps in the thicket, mirroring the vine-strangled object with the red eye from yesterday. Only this time, it was much, much bigger. He trudged forward, sidestepping huge blocks of concrete wearing mossy coats. Tried to ignore the niggling pain building in his head. A shadow fell on top of him. He looked up. Another archway, so large that Michael hadn't seen its curved top till now. It began next to him, a gargantuan shaft of black metal, thick as a bus, wrapped in branchy tendrils, that stretched far into the sky, before falling back down again and merging with the ominous hill. He couldn't shake the impression of a limb sticking out from the torso of a carcass. A dead beast. 
He looked to his right and saw more metal limbs stemming from the beast. One sprawled out to stretch across the entire square. Two more curled in on themselves. Four in total on this side. He'd been walking towards the wreckage to find a way inside, and Michael wondered if he was about to perform an autopsy on a behemoth's corpse. No. Despite its appearance, the thing was only a piece of technology, soulless even during its working days. He was searching for something capable of destroying a city, and this metallic beast had just climbed to the top of his suspect list. It went a long way to explaining the cruiser-scale damage scarring every street, to the Alliance headquarters slain next to its corpse. Once he reached the structure, metres away from where its body met the ground, Michael encountered a problem. There was no easy way in. Thick grass had forced its way through cracks in the surrounding paving, relishing the challenge of clinging to the metal and creating a bushy growth. The metal itself formed a second barrier, a tall black wall that stretched far into the sky wherever Michael looked. He walked alongside the wall, circling the beast, like scouting the edge of an arena, too big to take in all at once. The task took even longer due to the two limbs he encountered, laid out possessively across the square. He was able to climb the first sheer metal edge by pulling himself up some supporting vinery, but by the time he reached the second, he was so tired and his headache so severe that he simply walked around it. It took ten minutes to scout the length of the limb, its end buried in the churned-up ground, driven into the soil by its own weight. Michael had already finished the bottle of water in his bag when he rounded the leg and was on his way back. His head pounded more. Incredibly, Michael found himself wishing for some rain to provide another drink. Eventually, he reconnected with the main body of the beast, where the square met the wide, western-leading road, and he noticed a difference. The wall and foliage dropped away, where another chunk of black metal jutted out its top smooth and round like a giant egg. Even with the lower half buried into the soil, Michael could tell it was the beast's head. One massive red panel of diamond-shaped glass, a gargantuan version of the eye he'd seen yesterday, coolly gazed at him. Standing next to the beast, Michael felt small before, but this eye stretching to five times his height made him feel minuscule. He was very glad it was dead. To the right of the eye, the buried forehead, covered with moss and grass, provided a slooping rise for Michael to climb. It wasn't easy going. Weighed down by his rifle and backpack, he clutched onto springy plants and clumps of lichen to get a grip over the slippery metal. A few times he grasped handfuls of thorny vines, making blood bead out of his fingers. Michael gritted his teeth as pain and steam bellowed at the slight wounds, doing no favours for his building headache. At last, he reached the top of the rise, a plateau from where, to his delight, he found a hole blasted into the metal armour at the neckline. Michael paused, unstrapping the rifle from his shoulder and swinging it in front of him, switched the safety off. That eye set him on edge, the pure darkness facing him even more so. Out of the three rifles in the lobby, this one was in the best condition. The gun had a polished, matte grey length, a short shiny barrel protruding from the end, and a thick magazine jutting out behind the handle and trigger. He recognised the weapon instantly, due to the slight curve of the rifle's top guard above its barrel, where most of the weapon's heat vented. The BR-16, world's most reliable blaster rifle, at least in the eyes of criminals, revolutionaries, and any other group that favoured reliability and ease of use over all else. He held such rifles before, and despite its cumbersome size, the rifle was rather light. He might dislike its owners, but Michael held a certain respect for such steadfast design. Plus, it brought him a chuckle when he heard people confuse the name. BR meant blaster rifle, that much was true, its mysterious designers not wishing to claim ownership with a distinctive name. But 16 did not stand for the year it was built. The number was based on the model. The first experimental blaster rifles had not provided the safest experience for their users. Michael approached the opening in the beast's body. It was a small crack compared to the rest of a mighty creature, but big enough for Michael to slip through with ease. He scarcely believed the size of the armour as he moved past, 
over half a metre thick. He ran a hand along the makeshift entryway to confirm his eyes weren't tricking him. The beast's limbs would have needed every ounce of strength they possessed just to lift the abundant mass of armour. The utter lack of light waiting for Michael inside caused some primal part of his brain to recoil at the sudden plunge into the unknown. With the darkness came a deep, muffled silence, a close stillness that smothered his ears. No wildlife or wind in here, only a cool dampness with a heavy metallic smell that tickled his nose. The same scent as blood. Maybe it was. The oppressive atmosphere only worsened Michael's headache, now thundering with every heartbeat, and he paused, wondering. Everything exploded. One second, he strained his eyes. The next, he was thrashing, muscles tensing and convulsing at a sudden, unknown abuse. What was happening? Had the inside of the beast brought this on? He couldn't tell. Pain clawed at every fibre of Michael's being, so sudden and intense that he was certain he'd just been obliterated, torn up, ripped apart, and allowed to continue feeling. He couldn't tell where his limbs had gone. All that existed was the sensation of physical hurt attacking him both within and out. He looked around desperately for the exit, beyond the lights sparking and flashing in his head, for the gap in the armour. Was that steam rising around him, blocking the way? Where was the exit? He couldn't tell if his eyes were open. Rational thought escaped the world. Senses gone. Didn't even know if he was standing or curled into a ball on the floor. He tried to scream, but couldn't. The muscles in his windpipe refused to cooperate, wrapped in their own convulsing battle to survive the pain. When the wave of cruelty finally ended, he was not sure if he was passing out in the darkness or drowning in it.